<clears throat> it's called permineralization. There are three types of fossils, and we'll talk about those in just a second. The three types of fossils are, and I'm going to go back to this, there's no sound, is the footprint. The dinosaur print goes into the ground, it presses the limey mud, and then this hardens, and ta-da, it is a impression of a foot that left a track behind. And this is in limestone. Now, this is an impression of the impression, a cast as they call it, taken from the Paluxy River in Glen Rose, Texas. And there you have it. All right, good, good, good. Now, the second type of fossil or under the fossil umbrella is something that you don't know about unless you actually know about it. It's one of those. Um, we'll get to petrification in just a second. Most people have heard of petrified forest or wood or whatever, but this is the one that kind of gets you. It's called permineralization. Permineralize or permeate and then mineralize. It's minerals that permeate the existing protein or the living tissue. This right here is a dinosaur vertebrae. And the permineralization that took place here is that the crystals form around the protein, or let's just say the bone, okay? The, the little particles of bone that are in there, they're being surrounded by crystals. So there's still bone in here, but it's stone. That's the best way I can explain it without going any further. Let's leave it at that, but that's permineralization. So there's still some dinosaur bone in there. It's just that it's been surrounded by minerals. And minerals, as you know, is what the makeup of rock is. So essentially, this is a rock. Then there's the third type. The third type is petrification. Petrification. And normally we think about petrification in regards to wood, but any fossil to where there is no more living or even, let me put it this way, organic matter in the item itself is actually petrified. So that word petrification goes beyond just wood. It goes into anything that that transfer took place between minerals and living cells let's just say tissue or wood or, or whatever. So there you go. And those are the three types. Now the question is, how fast do they form? And does it really matter? Well, I'll tell you something. These fossils are actually trying to tell us something. It's like you just showed up at a crime scene and you're looking at these things and asking the question, what did this? How long ago was this done? And how quickly was it done? Now, we're normally told that fossils like this fish or this shrimp took millions of years, hundreds of thousands of years at least. Let me explain what that means. So this shrimp right here, according to the normal modern day geology, assignment of millions of years or a shall i say a timeline of millions of years has the um, ability to be able to utilize that extended period of time if need be in order to answer some questions like how long does it take and how old are they they have that luxury from a creationist perspective you have basically 6000 years of life 4500 years ago the worldwide flood and approximately one year of the flood itself and all of the extraordinary circumstances that took place during that brief period of time. So you have both. Both are really fantastic if you think about it because nobody was there except for Noah and his family. And other than that, we have to take Noah's word through Moses. Or we have to speculate that this took place 100, 200, 400 million years ago based on science, science. And I'm not mocking it. I'm just saying though, it's based on science. The problem is, is that this is not observable. Science has its own rules and that's great. I'm glad they do. And I love science. Thing is though, is that none of this is observable. We can observe certain things in nature, but we can't observe when that fossil was formed. 
We can only speculate. We can assume. We can gather bits of data and come to some kind of conclusion. I'm going to show you some of those bits of data for your consideration as you weigh out the, fa the facts and ask yourself, interpreting those facts, is it 100 million years or one year 4,500 years ago? Here's limestone. Limestone is a, uh, a bunch of small little skeletons that were crushed and then put together uh, to form this. That's what makes it so hard is the exoskeletons of these tiny little micro, almost microscopic uh, animals that got crushed and made into this. This is, we, we, we use this in order to make cement. And it's a, it's a wonderful stone. This was taken from the Paluxy River in Glen Rose, Texas. And when it's wet and when it's outside in the sun, it just glistens like white. No wonder they wanted to cover, and they did cover the pyramids with this limestone because it's absolutely gorgeous. Down in the Paluxy River in Glen Rose, Texas, they have dinosaur prints in the limestone. They assign the age 65, and actually it's a, about 100 to 108 million years is the assi normal assignment of that particular area uh, down in Texas. So this right here wouldn't be 65 million years. It'd be approximately 100 to 108 million years ago, according to modern geology that has assigned it that date. Watch this. In the same limestone, they found also, and this is this is a, uh, a replica of the original, um, and it looks just like this. They found a paw print in this same limestone. Now they cut this open to see if there's compression, and what does that mean? Just means that if it's faked, if somebody carved this and then said, "Here to a museum curator, here look what I found," you know, and let's say it was faked. When you fake something like this, you can't cause compression underneath this limestone area right here where the print is. You can't um, manufacture that with carving because when you split this open, and that's what they did, and you look at the cross section of it, you will notice whether or not it's been compressed underneath the skin, let's just call it, of this rock right here. Underneath here has to be, has to be compressed at least that's one indicator, that it's original. I'm sorry, that not only is original, but it's authentic and not carved. And this did pass that test. It was also uh, CAT scanned as well, too, to see microscopically whether or not there's compression. And sure enough, there is compression. Well, that kind of messes things up because the American lion... Uh, according to modern evolution and our modern day geology and evolution, paleontology, didn't go back much further than 350,000 years and didn't stick around until about 10,000 years ago. So that print in that limestone can be no earlier than 10,000 years, no older than 350,000 years, but it's in limestone that's assigned uh, an age of 108 million years. Now, that's a problem. If you look at it from the biblical perspective, that is a worldwide flood, then the dinosaur and the, the, the giant cat track can be in the same layer, or shall I say, the same formation of limestone. So how long does take a fossil take to form? Well, here's how it supposedly works, okay, from how I've been explained. So a fish comes along and let's just say it dies, okay? It dies and it lays on the floor or whatever body of water it's in. And then it quickly gets covered with silt and more silt and more silt and more silt. And then that silt hardens and then it becomes the begins the fossilization process. And as it does, then it can take millions of years. Once it has its form and the mud surrounding it hardens, from my understanding, the way it's been explained to me, then it can go through the 100,000, 500,000 million year process of fossilization. Is that true? 
That's what we're going to find out. One thing I do want to point out, when you look at fossils, and you won't look at them again the same way after I say this, because I didn't. Look closely and notice that the fins, the scales, the, t the very thin and uh, delicate bones are all there. Look at this. You know, if a fish died, you could just take it like this and go, <laughs> you know, and that's the end of it. I mean, it's full of water and life and everything, but once it dies, it's going to start to deteriorate almost immediately. So one clue we have is, is that whatever process or however length of time it took to form the fossil, it had to be buried very, very quickly. And not just some silt that goes across and covers it. Listen, my understanding is they did an experiment one time. They put a whole bunch of catfish, dead catfish in a cage, and they buried it in the mud five feet. And now I didn't understand the significance of that, burying in the mud five feet. I didn't get that. What they were trying to do is to show or replicate the profound uh, burial of these catfish in a cage and see what would happen. Now, I can't remember. It's been so many years. It was either six weeks or six days. I'm not sure. And it really doesn't matter because when they pulled the cage up, do you know what they found inside that cage? Zero. The fish were deteriorated, eaten, just there were nothing. There was nothing there. No bones, no anything. And that was in five feet of mud. Now we're talking about silt. Now in a worldwide flood context, you've got a whole year. First, you've got six weeks of rain. Then that water is sloshing around for another five months. That means sediment in tidal waves is going back and forth. And then with the phase, the rotation of the earth and the phases and the moon and its effect on tides, these tides are getting washed in, washed out worldwide every 12 hours. So things get buried, they get buried profoundly. And that's what you need. You need this so that all air is cut off. That the vermin that want to get in there, microbes, anything that can try to eat this thing and deteriorate this thing, it's almost like you're flash freezing it. But you're doing it in mud and silt and sand and water and compression. But profoundly, which means that this has got to get buried quickly and deeply so nothing can get at it. And then later on, after the fossilization process is over with, then through erosion or uplift or whatever, it exposes these and we can see them, you know, today. Okay, here we go. I promised you the 48-hour fossil, and I'm going to deliver on that. First, let me just show you one thing, and that is this is a leaf fossil. All right. It's hard to see it exactly, but I think you can see it. That's the stem bent backwards over it, like, like this. Okay. And here's another one. Here's another leaf fossil. Now, if you were to ask anyone who can know what type of rock this is and where it was located, where it was found, it, they'll assign it some kind of millions of years, okay? The only way that we can demonstrate this particular um, worldview or creation science, if you want to call it that, is in the laboratory. Because only in the laboratory does the uh, conditions that they suspect were there during the flood that they can be replicated there. You can't go out in nature typically and find those conditions. If you could, then we'd be able to unbury things that are in the process of fossilization, like all different stages of fossilization but you don't. You don't need time. You need the proper conditions. And those proper conditions are 
as they say, fossils are very, very rare. No, the fossilization process in order to be able to get to where it can do that to it is rare. And the reason why it's rare is because we only had one catastrophic flood and that was 4,500 years ago. So yes, the, but, but fossils are not rare. Are they, they think they say they're like 3 trillion fossils worldwide. That's not a rare thing, but the process is. So did it happen all at one time so many years ago? In a laboratory, utilizing the matrix that uh, possibly could be replicating uh, limestone or sandstone or whatnot, and heat and pressure, leaves were put into a chamber. And I'm going to show you what those chambers look, what these, sorry, the leaves look like. This right here is a fossilized leaf, literally. It's not painted on, it's not a photograph. Look how shiny that is. That's like manufactured rock. And that is a leaf. It took 48 hours in order to be able to produce this. And then underneath it, in another layer, a couple of more leaves. 48 hours. Some will say, well, you know, this is done in a lab. Well, yeah, it is. And it proves or adds weight to the idea of a worldwide flood that had these same conditions. Otherwise, think about it for a second. Otherwise, we've got these perfectly formed, we got these perfectly formed leaves. Well, no, let me show you. We've got these beautiful leaves that are flat, complete, and they got buried quickly. They didn't get a chance to, to do this. They didn't get a chance to do this, to start curling up and everything. If you notice the fish, if you notice the leaves, most of them all are just flat and perfect. What does that? Does something dying and then some silt go over it produce that? No. And if there's one, two trillion fossils throughout the world, then you know that it is not a rare process. It's only rare when the conditions are right, not because we see around us things today that are in different states of fossilization because they aren't happening. That's the reason why, because you need a worldwide flood in order to produce that. So if we lived 4,000 years ago and it was 400 years after the flood, wouldn't have that been interesting to dig some things up and see if they were already stone. All right. So listen, guys and gals, we're going to end there. And I want to encourage you, if you guys want to get a little bit cozy with us, text us, say, hey, John, and the, you can join our text group. We've got uh, nearly 300 people at the time of this recording, and it's free to the United States and Canada, 315-509-9075. When you text that and say, hey, John, I'll text you back and say, welcome. And uh, those who are on the text group got a text just before we went live here on uh, Facebook. Excuse me, YouTube. Ah! <laughs> I'm John Adolfi, the Lost World Museum, where we ask the provocative and important question, where do we come from? Apes, aliens, or Adam? I want to thank you very much for joining us, and you guys have a wonderful day.